on January 23, 1959, 10 20-something ski club members head out on a 16-day wilderness expedition to the northern Ural Mountains in the Soviet Union. Only one of them will live to tell. Late in the night, on February 1st, the nine remaining hikers will inexplicably tear out of their only shelter, casting themselves out into pitch darkness, temperatures hovering around 25 degrees below zero, some wearing just their undergarments and no shoes. All scatter away from the tent as if running from an executioner. Why did the nine students leave the confines and safety of a warm tent for the brutally cold, life-threatening conditions outside. That action went against everything they'd been taught to survive in the wild. Tragically, all nine will perish and several will bear strange and disturbing wounds when their bodies are discovered frozen in the tundra. This is the Dyatlov Incident, brought to you by Bed Crime Stories Podcast in association with Carnage Street. In the epic historical film Dr. Zhivago, the characters of Dr. Yuri Zhivago and his wife Tonya travel with their son and Tonya's widowed father to their country home known as Varikino. It's the unforgettable scene where the family comes upon their beloved country house in the winter. The mansion comes into view as a stunning ice palace because it's coated in a thick layer of ice. Icicles hang from the eaves like royal frosting on a gingerbread house. The estate is located in the remote Urals, a mountain range that runs north-south through Russia and beyond, spanning 1,550 miles. Those miles pass through the Arctic tundra to the north. Beyond the Urals lies the remote region known as Siberia. Mountaineers are drawn to the northern Urals for their breathtaking scenery and variety of flora and fauna. Come summer, Hikers flock to the Urals for the fresh air that's pungent with mountain herbs and wildflowers. In the winter, the northern Urals covered in snow are no less lovely, but the weather is extreme. Typically, only the native Manzai who dwell there remain in the region. If the sun is out warming the earth, the cold is tolerable, but if the sky turns dark, and snowflakes fall like a constant stream of confetti, the conditions become brutal, life-threatening. Factor in 40-mile-per-hour winds, and it's a recipe for disaster and tragedy. In those minutes and hours, the only things a mountaineer traveling through the region can rely on are layers of warm clothing, sturdy boots, nourishing food in one's backpack, physical strength, mental grit, in a sturdy tent, solidly rooted to the ground. And let's not forget matches and dry firewood. In the winter of 1959, during the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union, a group composed of 10 young students from the Ural Polytechnic Institute, or UPI, depart from the city of Sverdlovsk, for an expedition to Ortoten Mountain in the northern Urals. Svedlovsk is located 1,036 miles from Moscow and lies on the eastern side of the Ural Mountains. Back in Moscow, Nikita Khrushchev serves as the first secretary of the Communist Party. The hikers' route through the northern Urals has been approved by the Sverdlovsk City Route Commission and the head of the UPI's sports program. Most of the hikers are current students at the UPI. Some are recent graduates. All are between the ages of 20 and 23, save for one, 37-year-old Semyon Alexander Zoloterov, who goes by Sasha for short. Sasha 
will be a last-minute addition to the expedition. The initial group is made up of eight males and two females. They're about to head out on a 16-day trek of a lifetime through the Russian wilderness near Siberia in a bid to obtain their Grade 3 hiking certificates. Grade 3 expeditions are the most difficult and mean the students must travel 186 miles in a landscape far from civilization in the most extreme winter weather conditions imaginable. During their trek, the students will meet many fascinating characters, face the most difficult circumstances, bond over shared joys and miseries, talk endlessly in the evenings about philosophy and love, and ultimately cross to the other side under the most mysterious of conditions. For more than half a century, that mystery has continued to baffle. This is Bed Crime Stories Podcast. I'm your host, T, introducing the Dyatlov Incident, the first mystery by Bed Crime Stories Podcast in association with Carnage Street. Episode 1, Heading Out on a Grand Adventure. We have to head back to January of 1959 and the city of Sverdlovsk, where the Euro Polytechnic Institute is located. During the Soviet era, a university education is free for those who have the talent, and students are given a stipend, which is sometimes increased if they maintain good grades. The training is highly specialized, and the students only take courses in their specific fields. The UPI, which was founded in 1920 and rapidly expanded thanks to the Soviet government's industrialization program, which is calling for many trained engineers. The area around the UPI is filled with industrial plants. The UPI itself is a huge university with impressive architecture. The facade features a series of soaring columns, not unlike something you'd see in Athens, Greece. Back to the expedition. All the mountaineers in the group heading out in the Dyatlov group are highly experienced in lengthy ski and mountain expeditions. They are the best of the best that the school has to offer. If they successfully complete the expedition, and why wouldn't they? They'll each obtain their grade three certification. Such a certification is not only prestigious, it will also allow the young hikers to teach others their skill and to lead expeditions of their own. The route they've planned has the grade three designation, the highest degree of difficulty possible that time in the Soviet Union. Given the time of year, this route is estimated to be all the more challenging. In the summer, it would have been difficult, but in the winter, it will be a great feat. To qualify as a grade three expedition, the trip has to be at least 16 days long, and it has to cover at least 186 miles, with a third of the miles in challenging terrain, such as steep mountain ascents and steep descents. The mountaineers are also expected to trace during the trip, which means to make paths and tracks in deep snow, snow that may be as high as one's waist. They must also ski and hike through a dense forest with undergrowth. At least eight of the trip's 16 days must occur in a completely unpopulated area. That means that the distance to the nearest village at that point has to be at least 37 miles away by foot. In addition, at least six nights of the trip must take place in winter conditions, and the hikers can stay for no more than 10 days of the 16 in an abandoned hut or cabin. The rest of the time, they will need to sleep in a tent. But where they're ultimately going, there won't be any abandoned shelters. Whatever equipment and supplies they need, they're going to have to carry on their backs. That includes enough food for 16 days, clothing, matches for a fire, a flashlight, first aid kits, cameras, and a six foot by 13 foot communal tent. If they forget any one of those items, 
their trip could prove fatal. And this is 1959. So the students don't have cell phones, GPS, or any way to communicate with the outside world once far from the last occupied settlement. Also, they don't have the benefit of high-tech ski clothing or boots. Instead, they don padded cotton jackets and woolen ski pants. Gore-Tex would be the stuff of a sci-fi fantasy to these hikers. It's yet to be invented, and even if it had been, most of the students could not have afforded it. Now, let's talk about the beautiful souls who set off on this expedition on January 23rd of 1959. And let's breathe some life into the black and white faces that appear in the photographs and bring vitality to each of their names. Although these young people lived more than half a century ago, it's easy to feel a connection with them. Look beyond the black and white images and the dated clothing. Focus instead on the features of the students' faces, their smiles. When you do, they begin to appear just like 20-somethings of today. The group's leader is 23-year-old Igor Dyatlov. It is his name that gives the group their moniker, the Dyatlov Group. Igor is lean and strong, with a closely cropped haircut, wide-set eyes, and his family's signature gap between his two front teeth. Igor is also a bit of a celebrity at the UPI's hiking club because of his technical savvy and all the expeditions he's been on and led. A friend and hiking mentor of Igor's named Volodya Poloyanov said this about him. Igor had indisputable authority. Everyone wanted to go on a trip under his leadership, but one had to earn the honor to get into Igor's group. Igor comes from a family of engineers, and as a youngster, he'd shown himself to have a quick scientific mind. He's studying radio engineering at the UPI and is absolutely obsessed with the subject. His bedroom at home is outfitted with radio panels, homemade receivers, and a shortwave radio. A lot of people will later question why Igor, who has such a love for short wave radios didn't bring one along for the trip. The answer lies in the decade and location. Back in 1959 in the Soviet Union, short wave radios were large and heavy, weighing as much as 100 pounds. It would have been impossible for Igor to drag such a radio on the expedition, even if he wanted to. For this trip, Igor is most concerned this night with making sure that his members pack everything the group needs for the trip. Once on the trail, there'll be no convenience stores, no inhabited settlements, no one to call for help. They'll be on their own at the mercy of their planning and the weather. Mistakes are not allowed. To ensure everything's covered, Igor has assigned each group member a task. Each day, one member will write down the key information in the group diary, the events of the day where they traveled, how far they traveled, the weather, and more. A few members will set up the tent. Another will get the outdoor fire going. Another will assemble the portable indoor stove, etc. Let's discuss the two female group members. 22-year-old Zenaida Kolmogorova, Zina for short, is studying radio engineering at the UPI. Along with her interest in a subject usually reserved for men back in the day, she's also something of a tomboy. But Zena's athletic prowess does not take away from her beauty. Thanks to her soulful brown eyes, sculpted face, a wide, ready smile, smarts, and storytelling ability, Zena is, in a word, a charmer. In fact, several of the guys going on the expedition have secret crushes on her, but dare not say so aloud. 
There are two girls on this trip, and to tell one of them she is pretty without doing the same for the other girl is not the Soviet way. But there is one boy on the expedition with whom Zina had a little romance a while back, but they broke up. When she learns he's coming along on the trek, it likely causes her some anxiety and perhaps a few butterflies. He is, after all, a most handsome fellow. I'll tell you about him in a sack. When the hiking group is allowed to spend the night in School 41 in a small town on the way to the northern Urals in exchange for telling the school children in the morning about their upcoming trek, Zena is one of the lecturers, and the children quickly fall under her spell. They beg her to come back to visit them after the trip. The second female on the trip is Layudmila Dubanina, who's called Layuda for short. At 20 years old, Layuda is the youngest of the group. She's studying construction economics at the UPI. Layuda is a serious person by nature. She's also very physically strong. On a previous expedition, one of her companions accidentally shot her with a hunting rifle in the leg. You'd think that would have made her wary to head out again on such a trip, but here she is raring to go again. Layuda is also a fervent communist. Thanks to her economic studies, Layuda is given the task of counting and keeping the monies that the students had pooled for the trip. She will store the rubles in a waterproof can to keep them dry. The expedition members will soon be purchasing round-trip train tickets for the ten-and-a-half-hour journey to the Northern Urals and the same ten-and-a-half-hour trip back in 17 or 18 days. There'll also be a leg of the trip where the students have to travel in the back of a truck. That will involve a payment to the truck driver. In case you're not sensing it, let me just say this. This is not a glamping trip, and it's important to remember that these young people live in a remote section of the Soviet Union when every town has a communist party leader. Life is not a cakewalk. Money for most is tight. The young adults are used to roughing it, and they're also used to the incredibly cold temperatures of the winter. Next, let me tell you about the seven other young men on the trip. Three of them share the first name Yuri. The first Yuri is 21-year-old Yuri Doroshenko, who's studying radio engineering at the UPI. Doroshenko is known to have an impulsive personality and to be brave. Once, on one of the hiking club's earlier trips, he chased off a bear using a geologist's hammer with dimples and a smile that slanted up on one side. Doroshenko is a looker. He's also the tallest person on the expedition. He is sometimes pictured in photos wearing glasses. Doroshenko comes from a rather poor family, and if you look at him in the photos, he appears to be wearing a jacket that wasn't really adequate for the incredibly cold temperatures he will be facing. Yuri Doroshenko is, you guessed it, the young man with whom Zina fell smitten on a previous hiking trip. Can you blame her? He's handsome and he chased a bear. The second Yuri is 23-year-old Yuri Krivonoshenko, otherwise known as Georgie. Georgie is a friend of Igor's and he takes part in just about every expedition Igor leads. Georgie is the group jokester. He's got a big personality, and like Zena, he's a superb storyteller. Georgie is studying construction and hydraulics at the UPI. Unlike Yuri Doroshenko, who comes from a poor family, Georgie is from an affluent one. Both of his parents are well-educated and influential. His father is the chief construction engineer of the Beloyarsky Hydroelectro Station, and his parents often welcome Georgie and his friends to their spacious apartment in the city center of Sverdlovsk. Georgie is also a mandolin player, and he brings his mandolin on the trip to entertain his comrades. The third Yuri 
is 21-year-old Yuri Yudin. He's the guy who will have to turn back early on because of poor health. Yudin suffers from chronic rheumatism, a heart condition, and a great deal of knee and back pain. He'd even had to take a year off of school at one point due to illness, but he views hiking as an outlet that gives him greater health and vitality. Ironically, Yudin's poor health will be what saves him on this expedition. It is perhaps because of his rheumatism that Igor assigns Yuri Yudin to pack the medicine kits. Yudin has a boyish face and a set of prominent teeth that make his smile electric. He's studying geology and is said to be an easygoing person with a good sense of humor. Yudin also has a mad crush on Layuda. There's a touching photo of her giving him a big hug on the day he has to leave the group to head back home. He's happy, though, because he's sure he's going to see his friends again upon their return. Next comes 24-year-old Alexander Kolovatov. He's a student of nuclear physics at the UPI. Kolovatov is the only boy in his family of six children. Like Yuri Yudin, Kolovatov suffered poor health as a child. When Alexander was very young, his father was the financial director of a bunch of factories. But the family's fortunes changed later when his father was found dead on a railway track. The family lost everything. So now his mother works as a teacher and the family shares a small room on the campus of the school. Kolovatov is intelligent, and that's how he got into the UPI. He's also a very private person and is reluctant to share his journal entries with his fellow group members on the trip. He also likes to smoke an antique pipe. Next comes 23-year-old Rustam Slobodan, otherwise known as Rusti. He's the rich kid of the group. Hailing from affluent university professors, Rustik has already earned a degree in mechanical engineering. He, like Georgie, plays the mandolin. Rustik, despite his wealthy parents, is unpretentious, very friendly. Finally, there's 23-year-old Nikolai Thibault Brignol, or Kolya for short. Kolya is the great-grandson of a Frenchman who'd immigrated to Russia in the 1880s to work in the Ural factories. Nikolai has already graduated with a civil construction degree. He's serious and well-read. The last person who is added onto the group, unbeknownst to the group, is 37-year-old Alexander Dolotaryov. He goes by Sasha. We talked about him earlier. Sasha is a local hiking instructor. He's got gold teeth, several tattoos, including the name Gina on the back of his right hand, and an image of beets, the red root vegetable, on his right forearm. Who knows why? Sasha is an acquaintance of Igor Dyatlov's and is asked to tag along at the last minute. In fact, the other students don't know Sasha and will be somewhat wary of him when he shows up in their third-class train compartment. First, Sasha is significantly older than they are. Second, tattoos are highly unusual for the average Russian in 1959. The only people who typically have them are war-hardened veterans. And Sasha had seen combat in World War II. And those are our fearless hikers who are about to set out on the trip of a lifetime. Next time on the Dyatlov Incident, we'll rejoin the hikers as they divvy up supplies and fill their backpacks in dormitory room 531 of the UPI. Then we'll tag along as they head out on their journey, the first leg of which is a ten and a half hour train ride to Zerov. Their final destination of Ortoten Mountain is a long way from home. I hope you'll join me and the hikers for episode two.
Until the next time on Bed Crime Stories. Now do me a favor, smash that like button, subscribe so you don't miss the next episode, and I'll see you next time.